Well, good morning, Lakeshore family of God. I want to welcome you this day as the Lord calls and gathers us into his presence. And I know it's so much fun when to have fellowship time to see each other. Um, so what a good day it is to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, thank you for those of you tuning in by live stream. We are grateful that you have joined us and all of you here present. And uh, why don't we start by standing and just turn around and greet your brothers and sisters in Christ as they feel comfortable uh, with the peace and joy of the Lord. So let us come together as the Lord God calls us as his baptized children to come into his presence this day that we may worship, honor, and praise him in his name, the name of our God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All God's people said, Amen. amen. And he invites us to come just as we are with all of our burdens with all that we have wrestled with this past week, and to bring it to him. As the psalmist says in Psalm 130, Out of the depths I call to you, Lord. Lord, listen to my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for help. Lord, if you kept an account of iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that you may be revered. We couldn't stand in his presence because of our sin, but that he calls us to come just as we are to be forgiven. And so let us, at this time, if you would bow your heads with me, and let us come before the Lord, and whatever we've brought with us this day, whatever concerns or fears or anxieties, whatever sin we've wrestled with, maybe even this morning or this past week, let us bring it to the Lord in prayer and confess it to him and confess our need for his grace, his forgiveness, his mercy. Let's just take a few moments to examine our hearts and lives. And to just bring all of it to him. Oh, good and gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we do cry out to you. We cry out and plead for your mercy and grace. Lord, in the midst of life that at times can seem so chaotic and messy, and Lord, where we feel uncertain, and beset with fears and anxieties all around us. And Lord, we confess to you, oh Lord, how we get distracted, how we stray. Lord, from, from loving you first, from worshiping you in our lives. And Lord, how we get so drawn in ourselves. We can get so self-centered and neglect the person you put right in front of us to love. Oh God, we confess our sin and thought, word and deed, and that we need your grace. We need your forgiveness. We need your mercy to cleanse and heal us. We ask this, Father, for the sake of Jesus, your Son. In his name we pray. Amen. The psalmist goes on to say, I wait for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. In other words, I can't wait to see and to hear from him. It says, Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for there is faithful love with the Lord, and with him is redemption in abundance. He has redeemed you. 
redemption in abundance. That Jesus by his death and the blood that he shed on the cross. That there is abundant mercy. There is abundant grace. There is abundant forgiveness for us. And no matter what we're struggling with. No matter what our sin. No matter what our guilt. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And so I declare to you in the name of Jesus that redemption. You are forgiven and you are freed in the name of Jesus. Amen? Receive that as you turn to him and let that free your heart and open your mouths that we would give him all the praise, glory, and honor and sing our hallelujahs to him. For he forgives us. He releases us. We have, you have his love today. Amen. Let's praise him. Our hallelujah with endless joy. 
Close to the 
things in your hands, that you are the giver of every good and perfect gift, that it all flows from you. And even when we had turned our backs on you and brought death upon ourselves, yet you in the wonder and awesomeness of your faithful love pursued us, that you came in your son in our flesh to lay down your life and to die. How generous, how faithful, how awesome you are that you, the almighty, holy God, would come to us and give yourself fully to us so that we could be called your children. That's who we are because of what you have said. And Lord, let us live in the wonder and the reality of the identity that you have lavished on us as your sons and your daughters whom you love, that you generously lavish us with your gifts, with your grace, that we would live in the wonder and the awe of who you are, praising and worshiping you because of your grace that has set our hearts free, that we would live in that freedom rejoicing and praising you as your sons, as your daughters. For God, our Father, you rule and reign through your Son, Jesus, in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. One God, three in one. We worship you, we honor you, we praise you in your name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And we continue to worship and praise the Lord as we give of our tithes and offerings. I invite the hospitality team to come forward. We also, not only have we begun our offering um, with the baskets, we're going to begin the reverse offering. It's been a while since we've done that. So if you're new to Lakeshore, that second basket, okay, the first basket, okay, I see the first basket is the old pieces of paper. Take one or more out. That's a household necessity pantry item. So if you would bring that in in the next couple of weeks, we want to restock our household necessity pantry for our next giveaway. And uh, so that, yeah, the, the deep basket you don't take out of. <laughs> I want to remind you, you put in your offering if you brought that. And the, the shallow basket with the yellow cards, you take one of those out. And uh, now have a household necessity pantry item like detergent or, or whatever. You bring that in. And I, I do want to thank the family of God for your faithful giving and electronically and also when you bring your physical offering. And I just want to encourage, this is directed to the family here, just continue to faithfully give. And as the Lord bless you, blesses you, if you, know, if you can uh, even you know, give over and above or give a special offering. We're, we're kind of at a little budget slump. And so there's a little challenge that we're going through. So we just want to encourage the family of God that you invest in God's kingdom ministry here. And I just want to thank you for all that you do. And uh, as we look forward to our next giveaway. All right, well, I want to turn our hearts and attention to God's word this morning. The offering is being finished up. And uh, our first reading is from the prophet Jeremiah. And uh, you know, the basic theme in our readings is how God wants all his people to come home to him and to find mercy and grace and love in his presence. And here is a wonderful passage. The prophet Jeremiah is talking about how God wants to bring all of his people 
his Israel back home into his presence to save them. So Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 7 to 9. The prophet says, For this is what the Lord says. Sing with joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. Proclaim, praise, and say, Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Watch. I'm going to bring them from the northern land. I will gather them from remote regions of the earth. The blind and the lame will be with them. Along with those who are pregnant and those about to give birth, they will return here as a great assembly. They will come weeping, but I will bring them back with consolation. I will lead them to wadis filled with water by a smooth way where they will not stumble For I am Israel's father, and Ephraim is my firstborn. This is the word of the Lord. And then from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 23 through 28. This will serve as the basis for our message this morning. That Jesus is the fulfillment of God bringing us back to himself. Now many have become Levitical priests since they are prevented by death from remaining in office. But because he, Jesus, remains forever, he holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. Since he always lives to intercede for them, For this is the kind of high priest we need, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day, as high priests do, first for their own sins, then for those of the people. He did this once for all time when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak. But the promise of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son who has been perfected forever. And finally, from the Gospel of Mark, that we can come to him just like blind Bartimaeus. Mark 10, verse 46. They came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho, with his disciples in a large crowd. Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he warned him to keep quiet. But he was crying out all the more, have mercy on me, son of David. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man and said to him, have courage, get up, he's calling for you. He threw off his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered him, what do you want me to do for you? Rabboni, the blind man said to him, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has saved you. Immediately he could see And he began to follow Jesus on the road. This is the good news of the Lord. Please pray with me. Father God, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth. Your word gives life. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to us this morning. Right at our point of need. Oh Lord, that you would draw us, call us to yourself, and that we may see you with the eyes of faith. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, this past week, I called my mom, who lives in Omaha, Nebraska, and I was talking to her on the phone, and the conversation was, was going well for a while. Uh, she, what, then she, what was, then uh, Isn't that frustrating? What the heck did I just say? 
I, that, that's what, you know, it, the words were cutting out. And I was just like, Mom, Mom, uh, you, you're breaking up. And I don't know if she, has she moved to a different spot of her apartment or went out on the deck. Or something. And she's like, oh, you know, I always have bad reception. I always say our cell towers, or we need a new, new, new cell tower or whatever. And, and then she's talking to me, and then all of a sudden, Hello, mom, mom, click. Oh, yeah, isn't that frustrating? It's like, you know, this advanced piece of technology, you know, and sometimes like, mom, I'll call you on the landline. You know, we still have one of those. And, uh, but it never fails, you know, whether it's a bad connection, you know, it's like, was it on my end or was it on her end? Or sometimes, you know, maybe I'm talking to my brother who's on a business trip, then all of a sudden he hits a dead spot and there's no signal. And he's talking, you know, boop blinks out, and then he has to call me back, and yo, how frustrating is that? No signal, or bad signal, no connection. You ever feel that way spiritually with God? You ever feel like you have a bad connection spiritually? You're like, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I'm hearing from him, or maybe, uh, God, you're, you're breaking up. I'm not hearing from you. Or maybe you're like, you know what? Oop, no signal from heaven. You feel that way? You know, it can be easy to get to that place where you feel like, you know, maybe God's not hearing my pleas and my prayers. And, you know, I'm just not hearing from God. And I don't know. Maybe uh, I'm just, my connection with heaven is not very good. We can feel like that. And, you know, just think of how connected we are with our cell phones. I mean, bad phone conversation connections notwithstanding. Let's set that aside. I mean, just, just consider how people are walking around all the time with this thing, which, you know, sometimes I think it's going to grow out of our head. Uh, you know, and, and people are always, aside from those times that we lose that connection with someone on the phone, you know, that we're always connected 24-7. You know, and we're whipping it out. It's in our pants or, you know, we're holding it in our hands and we're checking our app or checking Facebook or checking our email. And you have it next to you on, on your, you know, nightstand. You wake up in the morning and you grab a hold of it. Always connected, you know, to this thing called the Internet and wireless and this invisible thing and yet we're connected. You know, what's kind of scary is Elon Musk, in the last few years said, oh yeah, this is like the first step in the transhumanist agenda to blend humanity with machines. That was a frightening comment. But you know that that is the agenda of some. You know, that they, they want man and machine and technology to merge. That we be united with our technology. That we be constantly connected through these technological means. Well, that's something to resist. But, you know, I want you to think about what if our connection with God was as ubiquitous and all pervasive like our cell phone? What if we're always connected to him and that we can always access him and that everywhere we go, we take our connection with God everywhere. It's not just like when you show up for church or, you know, I'm going to stop and do my devotions. It's like, what if you're always connected to him? And, and it's, it's, it, instead of the cell phone and wireless and the internet, and what if we're spiritually connected to God's heavenly presence 24-7? What would that be like? And you see, that's the reality that the writer of the Hebrews wants to get across to the Christians, first of all, he's writing to who are tempted as Jewish Christians who are being persecuted to turn away from Christ and go back to their Jewish faith and to the law and thinking that they can get connected to God in other ways. And the writer of the Hebrews is going, no, 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 no. The only way that we can be connected, stay connected with God is through Jesus and that we have been connected with God through Jesus once and for all. And that connection is good and stable. And it will never fail. And that's what the writer of the Hebrews wants to get across. 
not only to the first recipients of his letter, but to us today, you know, that all of our attempts to think, you know, that where we think we have to get to God or, or we have to close the gap or, or our struggles with wondering, you know, are we connected? I don't know. Is he listening to me? That Jesus is the connection point. That God has connected us to himself through Jesus once for all time apart from anything that we do. It doesn't depend on us, but it depends on Jesus. He's the connection point. And so the author here describes it in terms of calling Jesus a high priest. I want you to catch this. So for this is the kind of high priest we need. Now what is a priest? A priest is a go-between between God and the people. He's the mediator. He's the one who is the connection point between God and the people. He represents the people to God and God to the people and brings them together. And the writer is saying, that's what Jesus is. He's the one we need, not like all the priests that they had. Of course, you read Hebrews and and you get this history, historical details of what God gave his people, Israel. Because God wanted to restore his connection with humanity. We turned our backs on him and we broke that connection. Heaven was silent. It's like, you know, darkness. Like, sorry, no connection from heaven. And God made clear, I want to reestablish that. And so with, when he delivered his people out of Egypt and brought them to Mount Sinai, God made very clear, you know, his presence was on the mountain with the storm and the fire and the thunder. Now with the tabernacle, his presence in a very physical, tangible way was going to be in their midst. Yes, he's present everywhere, but we don't know Necessarily that he's present for us. And so he was going to be present for them in a very tangible, real way at the tabernacle. That tent that was in the midst of all of Israel when they camped and were traveling through the wilderness. That he was to be in the middle. And there was a pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. It was very tangible. But God, as Hebrews says, is like a consuming fire. He's a holy, just, righteous fire of love. And the problem is we as sin-darkened people cannot come directly into his presence. Otherwise, it would would consume us. It would eat us up. It would destroy us. It's kind of like, you know, you turn the light on in a dark room and the lightness destroys the darkness. So they, they could not live with or come into his presence as sinners. So he appointed a whole system with the tent and the tabernacle that there were priests, there were high priests, and they were to sacrifice animals, which, you know, to our Western minds, oh, this is just like, what is this business of sacrificing animals? But the whole point was, Because of our sin, the result is death. And God was saying, but I want to deal with your broken connection. I want to deal with that death. And I want to transfer it to another. And so the priests were the go-between, the connection point. And and they would represent the people to God. And they would offer up gifts and sacrifices every day, the morning, the evening, special sacrifices Passover, Day of Atonement, so that when these animals are slaughtered and killed, and I know if you're a lover of animals, you're like, oh, this is terrible. And, you know, there's bl- I can't imagine if you're a priest and you got this white, you know, your wife has just pressed off your white robe. And, and, and you go, and, and now it's stained with blood and it's dirty all over the place. But the whole point is God's dealing with their sin to redeem them, to, to breach that gap so they can live in his presence. But here's the thing. This was just an earthly, physical picture of a heavenly reality he wanted to accomplish. They had a foretaste of it. I mean, they, they, could, they could see, they knew that they were in his presence. He was with them, and, and their sin had to be dealt with. And, and it happened through a through the priests and the high priests who, who mediated. They were the connection point. But it didn't truly take away their sins. Because 
It was, it was physical. And besides, these priests were sinful. They were weak. And so the writer of the Hebrews says, now we have the kind of high priest we need. All of that was, was but a foreshadowing of the heavenly reality that is fulfilled in Jesus He is the one who steps into the gap. He's the one who steps into the breach to reestablish the connection between heaven and earth, between humanity and God, and that God the Son comes in our human flesh and blood to fill that gap. He's the kind of high priest we need, the go-between, the mediator, the connection point. And notice how he describes him. He's holy. He's dedicated, devoted to God, where we're not. We follow after idols and false gods. He's innocent. Without sin, we're guilty and sinful. He's undefiled. He's not corrupted by the world's influences where we're easily swayed and molded by the forces of the world that would tear us away from God. He's separated from sinners. Now, he loves sinners, but he's not going to be molded and shaped by sinners. Whereas for us, well, bad company corrupts good character and we're too easily swayed by the people we hang around with. But not Jesus. He's holy. He's innocent. He's undefiled, separated from sinners. And notice this, he's exalted above the heavens. In other words, he stepped down from heaven in our human flesh to earth to fill in the gap, to live the life we could not live, and that he could raise our humanity up higher in the heavens into God's heavenly presence. To reconnect our humanity to God's heavenly presence. And so he did this by sacrificing his life. All the lambs and goats and bulls that were slaughtered and their blood shed was but a pointer to what God the Son would do for you and me. He says he doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as the priests and high priests do. First for their own sins, then for those of the people. He did this once for all time when he offered himself. Once for all time, God the Son, having assumed our humanity, he stepped into the gap, into the the broken connection of our sin and death on the cross to fill it with himself. Once and for all. And, and, and to get a taste of just the, the significance of this, because, you know, we still strive in so many ways. You know, like these Jewish Christians, like, well, you know, I, I'll just try and be a good person. I'll try to obey God. You know, I'll try harder. I'll try to pray more. Or, you know, we, we try to think, well, if I just know the right things, the right techniques, you know, have a relationship with God, or, or we whip up the right experience, you know, that we so often try to get to God on our terms. And it's like, no, he's established the connection once and for all. Hebrews chapter 2 says, therefore, he had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way. He came into our flesh and blood so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest. The mediator who connects us to God says, in matters pertaining to God to make atonement for the sins of the people. That by his death and his resurrection for our sins, he put us at one with God. Or consider Hebrews 9, 11 to 14, a little bit of that. But Christ has appeared as high priest of the good things that have come in the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. That is not of this creation. See, the whole earthly tent and then the temple in Jerusalem, that was but a foreshadowing, a picture of, an earthly picture of a heavenly reality that has come true in Jesus and that when he went to the cross, he entered into the heavenly temple to bring our humanity back into God's presence. He entered the most holy place once for all time, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption that he bought and paid for our freedom, our release, our redemption from sin. Once and for all, it was done, finished. Nothing we can add to it. 
couple more. Consider Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with hands, only a model of the true one. Catch that? What happened on earth, the tabernacle in the Old Testament, was an earthly picture of the true one. And Jesus, in our humanity, he dies, he rises, he ascends, he brings our humanity back into the true temple, the true tabernacle of God's heavenly presence. It, but into heaven itself, catch this, so that he might now appear in the presence of God for us. In our place. In our humanity. Having paid for our sins, covered the gap, he now brings our humanity into God's heavenly presence. He's our connection point. He's our mediator. He is our restored connection to God. Every priest stands day by day ministering and offering the same sacrifices time after time, which can never take away sins. But this man, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. You see, this is a spiritual, heavenly reality. You can't see it with your eyes, but Jesus has reconnected us to God's heavenly presence. Which is why in chapter 10 he can say, now I want you to enter into this. Since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, he's inaugurated for us a new and living way. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. He's your connection to God. Because he lived a perfected life. So the writer says here, he says, For the law appoints a high priest, uh, men who are weak, but the promise of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son who has been perfected forever. And you might think, well, wait a minute, he's God, he's already perfect. But in our humanity, he perfectly surrendered, he perfectly worshipped, he perfectly trusted God for us. Now, Elise Fitzpatrick puts this in a great way. She said, think about it like this. Here's one way to look at Jesus' earthly life of obedience to God the Father. He lived approximately 33 and a half years, or 1,057,157,021 seconds. This will start to make your head spin. Uh, in every second, the average human being's brain has 100 billion neurons all firing around 200 times per second, giving a capacity of 20 million billion firings per second. If we want to know how many conscious decisions, decisions Jesus made to obey his Father's will, multiply 20 million billion by the number of seconds he lived, which was 1,057,157,021 seconds, and, well, you know, that's a big number. So I like this. She said, Jesus Christ never made one decision, consciously or unconsciously, in all those innumerable split seconds that wasn't completely consistent with loving his father and loving his neighbor. And his obedience wasn't merely an outward performance. He always did the right thing. He always did it for the right reason. And during his lifetime of constant, unwavering obedience from infancy all the way to death, he wove a robe of righteousness that now clothes us. That we enter into. He is our connection to God's heavenly presence. He is for us. And we know in Jesus that God's heavenly presence is for us. That we are connected through Jesus to God for the sake of all the needs in our lives. He who is perfect is for us at every point of our need where we're not. It says, now many have become Levitical priests since they are prevented by death from remaining in office. So first they die, and then they sin, and they're weak. But he, Jesus, remains forever. He holds his priesthood permanently. In other words, he's never going to stop being the go-between. He's never going to stop being the mediator. He's never going to stop being the connection point between God and humanity and humanity and God. He holds that position permanently. 
Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. To, to save completely in every way. In other words, his healing, his salvation, his deliverance is for every single part of our lives, for every need, for every hurt, for every pain, physical, emotional, spiritual. It's for all of us, every part of us. That when we come through him to God, that that healing deliverance, that salvation is for every part of us and our needs, our struggles, our hardships. One, he did it at the cross. One day it's going to be completed and we'll be completely delivered, completely freed. But today we struggle with fear. We struggle with you know, bodies breaking down. We struggle with emotional issues and hurts from broken relationships. And he says, I'm able to save and deliver you completely in the midst of all those needs. Now, yes, God's blessed us in creation with things to help the superficial kind of remedy. You know, you have a headache, take a Tylenol. You know, have a broken bone, you see the doctor, he fixes that. You know, you have you know, bad depression, you need an edge taken off, the psychiatrist can help with that. But in terms of the deep inner struggles and needs that we have, which is from our broken relationship with God and with one another, he says, I can save you completely. I am your healing. I am your deliverance. Because catch this, since he always lives to intercede for them. He lives to intercede, to pray for you and me. So that Jesus, who represents us to the Father, who represents the Father to us, he is at the Father's right hand. We're included in him. And he's saying, I'm praying for my people. I'm praying for them. I'm praying for their healing. I'm praying for their deliverance. That Jesus is always praying for you and for me at the Father's right hand. And not only that, but Paul says in Romans that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groans too deep for words inside of us. He says, we don't always know how to pray and because we're struggling and wrestling in life and, and we're not really sure what to pray. The Holy Spirit prays in harmony with Jesus who's praying. I want you to get a picture here. There's a 24-7 prayer service going on in God's heavenly presence. And you're caught up in it. And he's praying for you. Because his will is to save you completely. Every single hurt, every issue, problem, sin, failure, guilt, physical, emotional, he wants to deliver you. He wants to free you. He is for you. It's a great story of a young man who his phone, his lock screen password, a friend of his saw him, and he, he could see what the word was. It was this Latin word that said pronobus. Pronobus? What's that? His friend asked. Oh, it's Latin. What's it Latin for? For you. And then he started to get emotional. His friend's like, why is he getting all emotional about this Latin word, for you? And this young Christian man said, you know, I, I went through a painful time in my life. My parents had this terrible divorce, couldn't find a job, and I, I didn't think God cared. I didn't think God was with me until I heard a message that stressed those two words, for you, that because of the death of Jesus, God is for you in every way and he's with you no matter he said my struggles or my hardships and then so everywhere I take my phone I see those words first to remind me God is for me just like he's for you and he's enveloped us in Christ into his heavenly presence for all of our needs to come to God through Jesus now that means faith because we are connected to God through Jesus. And this is for all people who believe. 
He invites us to believe. He invites us to enter into this connection by faith. You know, to stress those words, those who come to God through him, through Jesus. Or in Hebrews 5, 9, after he was perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. This is not obedience to the law. This is about an obedient hearing and trusting in Jesus as Lord and Savior. A, a, a surrendering in faith to him. And it's by faith we enter in to this heavenly connection through Jesus. And we bring all of our needs, we bring all of our cares, and we realize he is for us. He's our healing. He's our deliverance. He's our salvation. You know, it's kind of like my cell phone. It's always connected. But, you know, if I set it down and I leave it, I don't have that connection with me. Unless I pick it up and take it with me. Or I hold it in my hands. And it's the same way with Jesus. He is always our connection. Our permanent connection with God. That will not fade. That will not weaken. That will not go out. But he calls us in faith to grasp a hold of him. To enter into that spiritual heavenly connection. Just like I take my phone with me everywhere I go. That you take that heavenly connection with you in Jesus everywhere you go. Those who come to God through him. And that's not just one time. Well, yeah, when I gave my life to the Lord, you know, 15 years ago. No, this is a daily coming to God through him. Living connected to God through Jesus so I want to close with this point. Because he invites us to commune with him. As we've been connected in Jesus once and for all, all of our needs. By faith to commune with God. Not only when we gather for worship. And this is a big point in Hebrews. The corporate gathering. But also each day. That we commune with God through Jesus. And, and you see, it's... You don't see it. It's like, well, it looks like earth. I don't see angels and I don't see heaven. And it's like, well, just like you don't see the internet or Wi-Fi, but you're connected. That through Jesus, you are connected. And to enter into that heavenly communion, and that word commune means to intimately communicate. You know, as we hear his voice through his word and the spirit causes that to resound and echo in us and, and we speak to him like blind Bartimaeus coming to Jesus and say, oh Lord, have mercy on me. Oh Lord, deal with me at the point of my need. Here's the reality. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast to our confession for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may find mercy. We may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus has connected us. And he invites us to live in that, to commune with God, not only when we gather and worship, but every single day. I want to close with a great account from a book called Faith That Endures, where Ronald Boyd McMillan, the author, had a chance to interview a, a well-known Chinese pastor who had endured a lot of persecution in the Chinese church. And when he met with this man, Wang Mingdao. Pastor Mingdao asked Macmillan, Young man, how do you walk with God? And Macmillan then just started to list off, you know, kind of almost like checking thing boxes off a list. Uh, oh, go to worship, disciplines like Bible study, prayer. And then he said the Chinese pastor mischievously retorted, Wrong answer. To walk with God, you must go at walking pace. He said, the words of Pastor McDowell touched me to the core. How can I talk about the Christian life as walking with God when I so often live it as a sprint? You know, as things I need to do, like checking off boxes off of a list, 
Of course we run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, but we may fail to run with our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. So Jesus is inviting me to walk with him. Too often I find myself running for him. What do I need to do for him? I'm doing this for him. I'm doing this for him. We're to walk with him. There's a difference. On another visit, he heard how Pastor Ming Dao spent 20 years in prison for proclaiming Jesus in China. He said that cell became a place of unchosen, unhurried time for Ming Dao. There was nothing to do but be in God's presence in Jesus, which he discovered was actually everything. And he summarized what he learned from Pastor Ming Dao, one of the keys to the faith of the suffering church. God does things slowly. He works with the heart. We're too quick. We have so much to do. So much, in fact, we never really commune with God as he intended when he created Eden, the perfect fellowship garden. But for Pastor Ming Dao, persecution or the cell in which he found himself was the place where he returned to walking pace, slowing down, stilling himself enough to commune properly with God. And so for you and me, whatever our cell is, whatever our hardship, whatever our difficulty, he's saying, slow down, walking pace, enter in through Jesus and commune with me each and every single day. For Jesus has connected you to God once for all, and he is for you. Amen? Amen. Please stand. Ah, how good that is to know that he is for us. And that's the reason why we pray, because he is for us. And so let us approach the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us and one another in our time of need. Let us pray. Oh, Lord God, Heavenly Father, hear our cries as we, like Bartimaeus, come crying out for mercy. But we pray that you would open the eyes of our faith, the eyes of our heart, that we would truly see Jesus and his sacrifice once and for all for us that has opened the way that we may live and approach you in your heavenly presence. That we are in the holy place by faith. And to know that you are for us that you have loved us with an everlasting love, that you have accomplished an eternal redemption once and for all time, for all of our needs, and that one day we will be completely saved, completely delivered, completely freed, and we pray that you would strengthen and deepen us in faith, that we would walk with you, not sprint or run for you, but that we would walk with you that we would commune with you each day. Lord, in the midst of the hardships and struggles of life, that you would meet us at that point by your spirit and open us up to enter in and commune with you by your word, in prayer, in the spirit. And we pray, Lord, for your church. Oh, Lord, that, that we would be a reflection of your great love for us knowing that we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ, that we would stand firm on the truth of your word and declaring that in the midst of a broken, crumbling culture, that you would make us lights in the darkness. And we pray you send laborers into your harvest. Lord, that you would call and gather people from the ends of the earth. And Lord, all those around us, Lord, who don't know you, that you would draw them to you. And Lord, use us. Give us opportunities, Lord, to love, to express the love of Jesus. And Lord, where there's opportunity, give us the words to testify to the hope that is within us. Oh Lord, you've appointed us as priests in your kingdom to represent you to the people. And also to represent the needs 
of the people to you. And Lord, so we offer our prayers. And Lord, our living sacrifices, Lord, of praise and of our lives to serve you, our great high priest. Oh Lord, make us a priestly people that our lives would be a living sacrifice, lived in the worship of you. And so Lord, we bring our prayers to you this day, praying first of all for our nation. Lord, that you would tear down the pride and the arrogance of people who are living without you. And Lord, of all the ungodly philosophies that would seek to live life without you, Lord, that you would bring people to the end of themselves. And Lord, we pray for our nation that you would turn us back to you in a way that we would see in you, Jesus, the heart of the Father, and that you would revive your church in these days. Lord, that we would not give in to fear or anxiety or the propaganda or lies of the enemy. But Lord, that we would stand firm on the truth of your word and that we would be your instruments of healing and mercy and compassion and righteousness for our nation, for our communities. And so, Lord, we bring before you the needs that are in our midst. And, Lord, we pray for those who are struggling in their health that you grant healing and recovery. We pray for George Huff's mother who is in the hospital with pneumonia. Lord, we pray that you would grant healing and recovery to her. Lord, as we also pray for Charlie Hibner, Lord, who will be having more tests. And, Lord, a brain test and number of health issues. Lord, we pray that you would minister to her at her point of need. Strengthen and comfort. And Lord, that you would grant healing according to your will. And Lord, all other needs we offer up to you. And Lord, those who grieve and mourn the loss of loved ones, we pray for your peace. Those struggling to make ends meet, we pray for your provision. And in all things, that you would be the anchor of hope for our lives. Trusting in you, coming to you, ever to your throne of grace, praying as you taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. <coughs> Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. has spoken I am forgiven the king of kings 
calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my living home hallelujah praise the one who set me free It's grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. He's the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip. and the communion of, communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you always that you may know that you are connected to heaven's presence in Jesus and that he is for you. Amen? Amen. Love on one another. And a well, quick note, um, there are prayer thoughts for the day for each month that are back at the information center. We have a prayer group that uses those. If you want to follow us, you can use those. Also want to invite you to stay, kids, for our Bible exploration, adults here, about 10 minutes or so. We can help these, wait a minute, is it all the chairs? Shannon, Shannon, is it all? All chairs? Five high, as you're greeting one another, if you're a little service project, stack the chairs five high and push them to the walls. Thank you.